So this is a good one. I think a lot of people have been asking this. What do you think about Brian Johnson? He actually does not claim to reverse aging, which I've, I've heard not claim that, which I appreciate. He says that he's severely decreasing his rate of aging. Yeah, again, I think it, I think it depends on how you measure rate of aging, right? So uh, first of all, I have, to, I have to be clear. I don't know Brian Johnson personally. He's a friend of a friend. So I've heard stories about him from, from my friend. Um, uh, but I don't know him personally. And honestly, I don't really follow him. So, you know, I can't comment in any level of detail about the content that he puts out. Um, I think the question of, is he slowing his rate of biological aging? Again, it really depends on how confident you are that the biomarkers we have today are accurately measuring biological aging. I don't see any reason to doubt that he has had an impact on his epigenetic profile. Uh, um, and I absolutely believe that his biomarkers have gone in the direction we would consider um, being of uh, improved health. That's exactly what you would expect for somebody who adopts a very clean lifestyle. Mm. So so is, I think it really boils down to the question of, is improving health the same as reversing biological aging? I don't feel that it is. Can we say that you have probably slowed your biological aging? Yeah, that doesn't seem unreasonable to me uh, that, uh, improving lifestyle factors can slow biological aging. So I have no, you know, I have no problem with the idea that he probably has slowed his biological aging and the biomarkers he's using reflect that. Okay. Do you have an opinion on the other Brian Johnson? Do you know who that is? The liver king? Do you follow him at all? <laughs> they're, they're both named Brian Johnson. They both had a huge 2023 and it's just funny how they're on other ends. I, of again, I, no, I do not follow yeah. liver king. I would not follow liver king. Um, I don't know anything about him except my recollection is from hearing you know stuff that he claimed he got his uh physique by was it just a carnivore diet eating only meat Pretty was much, it only yeah. liver i don't know is that where he yeah, gets his name based. Yeah. <laughs> and then he got caught doing steroids yes. is that a essentially the take home yeah. it's a take home yeah, yeah. Right. so right. I, I mean that story sort of speaks for itself i just love um, how they have the same name but <laughs> What's your opinion about touring? Sounds too good to be true. Some of the claims made are it restored vision in cats that had gone blind. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with the cat blindness um, claim. I think what I would say about touring is from an a biological aging perspective, um, I would kind of put it in the second, the second tier down uh, in terms of things that I'm enthusiastic about. And the reason for that is that, I mean, I was involved, I was a co-author on the study. I didn't, I didn't have a huge role in the study, but I, I was, I did some of the experiments in my lab where the study showed that in laboratory animals, um, really pretty much everywhere from worms to mice, you could, you saw a decline in taurine levels with age and you could supplement that back and increase lifespan. That's pretty compelling. And then they also had primate data showing that some evidence for health span improvements. And then some human data, at least in one population, that taurine levels decline with age. So it's only one study, but it was a really big study looking across multiple different um, organisms, suggesting that taurine supplementation can have an impact, positive impact on biological aging. So I kind of put it in this category where the data right now are pretty compelling. Um, there's also evidence in companion animals that taurine deficiency can lead to heart disease and that you can supplement to rescue that. So so, so I, I think it's intriguing. I would really like to see, you know, additional studies um, validating the effects on lifespan in maybe another mouse strain. I would love to see the interventions testing program test taurine um, before I really jump on board and say this is something that that you know has a lot of evidence supporting it as a supplement i I'm not aware of any downsides it doesn't mean there aren't I'm not aware of any risks associated with taurine supplementation so I kind of put it in the bucket of might be helpful very unlikely to be harmful so you know it's it's an individual decision whether you would want to supplement or not. I don't, for what it's worth. Can you explain why we are comfortable with a high-protein diet when protein restriction inhibits mTOR and aging in humans associated with hyperactive mTOR? Would you feel as comfortable with a high-protein diet if you were not also taking rapamycin? Uh, most of us cannot access rapamycin. It's extremely difficult to decide whether high or low protein is optimal in aging. Yeah. So this is a complicated question. I've talked about it on, on multiple occasions. I really, I, want, I don't want to get into the weeds on rapamycin and protein. Um, what I would say is if we look at those two things separately, uh, 
I still think the the bulk of evidence from human studies suggests that above, again, is it 55? Is it 50? I don't know. Above some some age, the benefits of a high protein diet outweigh uh, any increased risk that you have from a high protein diet in terms of cancer or other age-related diseases. The benefits accruing largely likely being body composition, frailty, things like that, functional aspects of aging. Having said that, again, I think people spend way too much time worrying about the amount of protein in the diet and not enough time worrying about the quality of the diet. I think quality of diet trumps whether you're eating a high protein, low protein diet every day of the week. So that's where I would say you should focus your attention first. My view is that for people who are eating a high quality diet, and by that I mean cutting out highly processed foods, cutting out added sugars, you know, things like that. For people who are eating a high quality diet, lots of vegetables, um, a diet higher in protein is probably net beneficial over a diet low in protein. And again, the evidence I point to for that, and admittedly, it's a it's it's probabilistic, it's my own opinion, it's a bit of a guess. Evidence I point to that are epidemiological studies suggesting that above that certain age threshold, people eating a higher protein diet do better, all-cause mortality, frailty, things like that. Um, and in the studies that have looked at diet quality, it seems like some of the risks associated with high protein, maybe all of the risks associated with high protein, which are mostly in the realm of cancer, when you control for diet quality, go away. So it's really more the case that people who are eating a lot of red meat, for example, are also tend to eat a poorer quality diet. And when you take that diet quality thing out of the equation, the risks of high protein tend to tend to decline. So the, the challenge here is you can find evidence to support whatever position you wanna take on this. And so I think it's really hard to draw definitive conclusions. So you kind of have to figure out what works for you. But again, I don't think anybody can argue with the idea Get the diet, get the diet quality piece figured out first, then worry about protein. Um, uh, and then the last thing I would say is like, I, I know a bunch of people, like I've been in this field long enough. I've known people who have tried all sorts of different dietary interventions, caloric restriction, protein restriction, once a day eating, all of that stuff. And this is, this is my own anecdotal view of having seen the changes in those people. The people who adopt a low protein diet, in my view, look sickly and frail. What does that mean? I don't know. They look weak. Okay, so I take that into consideration when I'm making my own decisions. And next to quality, you also have quantity. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of Americans are eating low protein, but they're hypercaloric. So that right. Point, no, you're right. You Absolutely. Miss. I tend to, you're right. I tend to, in my own head, equate diet quality also with total caloric they're consumption. But, but they don't have to be, but often they are. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Yeah. Over consumption of calories combined with high protein is net worse, almost certainly. And there you can make a really biologically plausible argument, right? So we know protein consumption is associated with insulin-like growth factor one levels, growth hormone levels, mTOR activation, although I'm, I'm less convinced that a high protein diet robustly activates mTOR across many, many different tissues. Certainly you can find evidence to support that. That's probably the case that there's some activation of mTOR. So you've got upregulated growth signaling combined with hypercalorie, right? Which is probably also going to be inflammatory. That's a bad mix when it comes to all sorts of different age-related diseases. So yeah, I think you're right. I think it's not just diet quality, but it's amount of calories being consumed combined with high protein that are that's probably worse. And in the in the situation of hypercaloric consumption low protein is probably better. Okay. Yep. Speaking personally, I'm kind of cutting some weight for the summer for the upcoming DEXA and I'm high protein, about 200 grams a day, but I'm low calorie. And yeah. in the meantime, I feel great. Yeah. Eventually, if I continue this road, I won't feel great. But right. I've noticed like my aura ring, like my heart rate is looking lower and right. HRV is higher. Right. But. Yeah. So again, I think that, and I mean, I think being guided by what, what works for you makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. What is a good nutritional slash vitamin slash omega-3 blood test to use? Yeah, so I think I've mentioned previously on the podcast in the past before, you know, before we developed our own our own uh, blood work here at Optispan, I've used Ulta Labs. I found them to be a, a really easy way to 
get the panel you want, schedule your blood work at a local quest, go get it done, and then the data comes back to you. So I don't have any, like no conflict of interest, but I've used Ulta Labs. They, they worked well for me. Um, I will say we're in the process of developing our own OptiSpan blood test that hopefully at some point we'll be able to make available for people who want it. The idea here is really just to make, make it as easy as possible. So probably we will have a blood panel People can go to the website and order, get their results back, and then get recommendations on that. So we've got to figure out all the all the pieces there. The regulatory environment, you know, you have to you have to work within the appropriate regulatory constraints. But I'm hopeful we'll be able to make that available in the next three six months. And if we do, we'll mention it on the podcast. 